Welcome to From Betrayal to Breakthrough, and here is a mini dose of Dr. Debbie where I'm sharing tips, suggestions, strategies, and sometimes just motivation to have you move past your betrayal once and for all. Hi there. So one of our PBT Institute members had a question, and I thought it was such a great question that it was worthy of an entire podcast episode. If you've been betrayed, most likely you've been through this. You're in a, uh, a group of people, you're at a party, you're at an event, you're out to dinner, you're just doing whatever with a bunch of people. And all of a sudden the conversation comes up around betrayal. Someone did something to someone and they're talking about it. It's just, whether it's just, you know, gossip, they're not sure how to handle it. They're not sure what to do. They just want to everybody to know who's doing what to who. And here you are so uncomfortable because these people may know, they may not know. And what do you do with this? What do you do when you're in that scenario? That's the question. And I thought it was worthy of an entire episode. So here we go. I have been in this situation many times and not going to lie, it's incredibly uncomfortable. And you go through so many different emotions. You're you're just number one, uncomfortable. You're, uh, you're angry because here you are put in a position you never asked to be in. You're in a club you never asked to be a part of, and you're in it. You're embarrassed, humiliated with something you didn't even do. You're, uh, you, you don't know, do I leave the conversation? Do I stay? Do I contribute to it? Am I acting weird? Like you're going through so many things in such a short amount of time. So I wanted to give you a couple of ways to possibly move through this. And as always, check with your gut, see what feels right for you. See what feels right. So this is how I responded to her. And I'm going to give you uh, the response I gave her and possibly a couple of additional ideas. So let's say here you are, you're, you're out with people and you're, uh, and, and let's say they don't know. Okay. So they don't know, but you're feeling like I've been keeping this big, gigantic secret out of shame, humiliation, embarrassment, fear of judgment, whatever. And now the conversation comes up and they're talking about, did you know that so-and-so had an affair and this one cheated on that one and all of these things. And you're like dying inside. What do you do with that? Well, a couple of things you can, um, your silence may be deafening. So you may feel like, oh my gosh, I really need to say something. What do I say? What do I say? What do I say? And maybe you just say, oh, that really stinks. I feel so bad for you know him or her, whoever you know was betrayed. You, so you could do that and that's your contribution and you move along. You can, if you're, uh, let's say you're not all sitting together, but let's say you're in a, there's a group and it's like a party and you can roam around and wander to different, you know, tables or groups of people, you may just be like, you know, excuse me one second, I'm just going to go grab a drink. And I would not recommend alcohol because when you're not feeling well, uh, your judgment will be off and you don't want it even more off because you want to be completely in control of what you say and do. So go get a drink, non-alcoholic, and you handle it that way. So this way you remove yourself from the conversation. So already we came up with two plans. One, when you're sitting with, you know, in a group and you feel, I need to contribute, I need to say something. You don't want to come up with it on the spot. That's always so much harder. You want to come up with it ahead of time and this way implement it when it, when the situation arises. So something short and sweet that just this way, it's not like you're not speaking up, which may bring more attention to you saying enough if you feel like this is right, that uh, you're contributing in some way, and then uh, and then you know they're on to the next person who's talking about it, that's fine too. So whatever that whatever that sentence is, uh, you know I feel so bad for that person, or you know I hope the kids are okay, or whatever whatever you decide feels like a fit. If you're like I said at a party in a group where you can get up and walk away, possibly uh, just excusing yourself, you know, oh, excuse me a second, I'll be right back going to get a non-alcoholic drink, going to the ladies' room, men's room, uh, and just excusing yourself, going to a different group, whatever. So two, two options right there. 
and, and again, having these ideas beforehand is always so much better than trying to come up with these things on the spot. So those are, those are two things. Now, what happens when you're, um, let's say they do know, so they do know whoever you're with knows, and they're bringing this up. Maybe just out of a lack of empathy, they just think you're over it by now. You're doing fine. It's just, they didn't think whatever, whatever, whatever. This has come up for me personally, more times than I can count. And it's, it's, you go through a, a different set of things right here because, you know, you, you may be so empathetic and thinking ahead uh, I know I, I live this way. If it's going to hurt, don't do it. And I've shared this on so many different episodes. And so typically I'm, I'm pretty mindful of who I'm speaking with and what their experience is that I'm aware of. And if it's some, if something is going to hurt, don't say it, don't do it, period. And, uh, and it's, it saved me from <laughs> a lot of getting into a lot of trouble. However, uh, there have been so many times where I'm, you know, I'm giving people the benefit of the doubt, well-meaning people with just a lack of empathy, say really hurtful things. They're telling a story. They know what you've been through, but they, they're telling a story and, and think, oh, this can't possibly bother them or they're, they're because they're, it's, it happened so long ago, or they, I'm sure they're over it by now, or they're just not thinking of you at all. And not, you know, with that lack of empathy, it's just not even a thought. But meanwhile, you're sitting there and this is very triggering the conversation, the story they're telling the, uh, what they're joking about is really, really hurtful because the pain for you is still there. Well, what do you do in that scenario? You know, do you, do you say something to the person? Likely that's not going to go over. Well, there's just a lack of empathy and most likely they'll get defensive, argumentative, you know, and, or possibly, oh my gosh, I had no idea. I didn't think about it. I'm so sorry. That could be something, but how do you handle it in the moment? Again, same thing. You can have something in your back pocket, ready to say when you need it, you can walk away from the conversation. You can even, before you even go to these events, you know, and I think I shared this on another episode. I had a friend who would energetically uh, put herself in this sort of protective bubble where what anybody would say wouldn't penetrate. She kept this kind of energetic protection around her and that really helped. So this way it wouldn't, it would only get to a certain level, wouldn't get in, wouldn't get through. She would be more like, you know, uh, a Teflon where it sort of doesn't stick. And that really helped her. So that's something as well. So you definitely prepare yourself ahead of time if you can. If you don't think about it, that's okay too. But have those uh, those those tools in your back pocket. What you're going to say if somebody talks about something, someone, the gossip, the latest gossip, the uh, you know the latest happenings of who's doing what to who, and it's really hurtful. Or someone who just has a, let's say a lack of empathy. They're telling a story. Oh my gosh, I can't believe th this is what happened. So-and-so did this, or maybe they even did that. And you're struggling with all of this, but come up with either a sentence or a way to walk away from it where you feel good about it. If you feel this person was really, um, is worth talking to about it, like, Hey, you know what? I'm close enough to you that I can let you know any jokes or stories about, people cheating or, you know, betrayals of any kind hurts. It just doesn't feel good. So can you just do me a favor when I'm around, just be a little mindful of it. If you want to say something like that, if you feel like this person has, you know, so little empathy, it'll never land well. I'm just better off protecting myself and limiting my time, limiting my exposure to this person. That's okay too. So we have a couple of plans in place right now. What about, what about when you're rebuilding. Okay. When you're rebuilding, this brings a whole other set of issues because there is a tremendous amount of judgment around rebuilding because, you know, you've heard this so many times, once a cheater, always a cheater. And that person is so weak getting together, getting back together with that person. I have to tell you before I had been through this myself, I was one of those people who kind of judged. I was like, how in the world? Can you ever uh, get back together with that person? And what I've come to learn 
in my own experience and in working with our rebuild members um, who they are the betrayers, you're not getting back together with that same person. They are not the same person. They're not remotely close to that same person because if they are the same person, it's true. What the heck are you doing? But if they are radically different, it's a very different story. And having uh, seen it myself in my own experience and with those rebuild members, it would be hard to believe. But also going through the five stages from betrayal to breakthrough myself, I am not the same person I was. And there were so many times where I wasn't sure, do people really change? And then I would remind myself, look at you. You're a totally different person than you were before your betrayal. Why is it so impossible to think that the absolute crash and burn of someone else's marriage and mind and heart and rules and relationship and everything, once that came to a full and complete crash, they couldn't wake up and rebuild their lives and themselves as well. So, so it was the opening and the, um, the willingness to consider that, wait a second, if I can transform, so can other people. If I can change, so can other people. If I can think differently, so can other people. And I have seen it over and over again. Now I'm not talking about the person, the betrayer who's just on to the next and shaming and blaming you as if you, you know, the betrayed, as if it's your problem, you did something wrong. That person is completely incapable or unwilling at this point in time to do anything differently. I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about the person who has uh, completely and totally changed because they get it. They have had the crash and burn of their lives just as you did as the betrayed and they see things very differently. So I'm talking about them. So let's get back to here you are, you're rebuilding and uh, people that you're with don't necessarily know that and they're making comments about, can you believe she's getting back with him? Can you believe he's getting back with her after this and that and the other thing? This is again uncomfortable because you don't know the circumstances around what it is that those people are going through, that couple that they're gossiping about, what their story is, what their scenario is. You only know about you and what you're going through. And the truth is, and this is what I firmly believe, if there, if nothing changes, nothing changes. The same saying I say all the time. If, if there are no changes, you are setting yourself up for more misery and pain. Why would you do that? But if you've completely transformed and your partner has completely transformed because of what you've been through, you are headed for potentially a 2.0 relationship. It's a very different thing. Now, getting people to understand that who have not been through it or who don't, who just have never experienced anything like that, it's a rough sell. So why bother? Because chances are they have their fixed opinion and that's not going to change. And if I tell you, even just looking at, sometimes I'll read comments and see, you know, as, as thick of a skin as I'm trying to have, I'm still pretty sensitive. So, but people say things, I mean, I get comments all the time on uh, my TEDx talk. Do you have post-betrayal syndrome? I stopped reading them, but uh, some people, you know, are, are just really um, opinionated about that and don't believe uh, people can change because in their experience, that hasn't been the case. So of course, people only are coming from their own experience. If in their experience, they're, you know, they were betrayed and then they were betrayed again and again and again, and they've seen their partner do it again and again and again, then of course, from their experience, that's all they know. And they don't understand that people can change only though, if they want to if they are ready and if they've lost everything, that's a big motivator. So that could be a big, uh, a big issue as well. But either way, when you are in that scenario where you are rebuilding and people are judging and critiquing and all of that, what do you do? Same thing, have a statement ready and waiting to implement. If people know what you're going through, if they do not know what you're going through or simply walk away from the conversation. So, We've talked about a few scenarios when people don't know, when they do know, when they have no empathy and they know, or they don't know, right? What do we, how do we handle that? Now, since we talked about as you're rebuilding, let's say you're rebuilding, you go, uh, you're out with these people, the conversation comes up. It is incredibly awkward and uncomfortable, and you're filled with all of these different emotions. And then you bring this to your partner the one who betrayed you that you are that 
who is working on becoming someone completely different as are you. What, what happens now? Well, this is a really pivotal moment right here because this, uh, how this person reacts and responds is, is uh, very telling because if they're minimizing, if they're blaming you, if they're uh, giving you a hard time, anything having to do with you, that means they are not taking responsibility and that needs to be cleaned up. Number one, they need to take full and complete responsibility for their actions and behaviors because that's why you're in this position you're in. And the second thing is, this is a beautiful opportunity for them to show up powerfully and fully. And they can say anything like, oh my gosh, that must've been so painful for you. I'm so sorry I put you in this position. What do you need right now? What can I do, right? Something like that, whatever the words are, but the essence of it is they're taking full and complete responsibility. They're owning it, they're dealing with their stuff and they're also there for you. So that's the winning combination right there. You know, what do you need? How can I, how can I help you through this? It sucks that I did this to you. What can I do? Right. Whatever they're taking ownership, they're taking responsibility, they're cleaning up their stuff and they're, they know you're, uh, in a lot of pain because of this experience. What can I do for you? So really important how your partner you're rebuilding with shows up in a scenario like that. If they minimize shame, blame all of this, there's work to do. That is not uh, that's not what you need at a time like this. So how do they respond? You want to just check that. And, uh, of course, you know, you, you may need to teach a little bit. This is what I need. This is exactly, these are exactly the words I need to hear when this happens. Um, and then see if the next time you're in that scenario, that's implemented, write it down, have them write it down, whatever it is, you need to get what you need at a time like this. Do not settle for, well, it's hard for me. Well, it's uncomfortable. Well, what can I do? I, there's nothing I can do about it. I didn't say it. I didn't do it. No, 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 no excuses, no blaming, no, nothing. You need what you need ask for it and get it as part of a rebuild. Remember rebuilding is deliberate. It's intentional. It is all about, you know, my saying, I've been saying it for my 33 years of business hard. Now, easy later, easy. Now, hard later, take your pick. It's one of those two. This is hard. Now, this is the work, this, these types of experiences, this is the work. So this is hard now. So will it be awkward and uncomfortable for them to be vulnerable with you and be there with you when you are triggered in this way? Yes. And that's okay. That's okay. We need 100%, uh, 110% at the time we need it. No uh, making excuses. If you are the uh, betrayer, no accepting excuses. If you are the betrayed, get what you need. You are redefining a relationship. It's based on new rules. Do not accept the old rules. If the old you was like, you know, would say, eh, well, it's hard for them. Okay. And <laughs> right. You're, this is a new relationship. A new relationship comes with new rules. If you're accepting the old, then remember your new relationship is based on new rules, new levels of respect, a new level of you and the new level of you needs a new level of partner. And that's, that's what you're working towards. And that's what you need. And that's what you deserve. So how they respond and react in a scenario like this is really important. So you've been through the experience, whatever it is, whether they, people know, whether people don't know, whether they just, maybe they have just no empathy and it, they just think for whatever reason, you're past it. It's old news. You're it's behind you, or they just don't think period right? Whatever that scenario is, you have your plan in place, you have, uh, or you excuse yourself from the conversation. You uh, bring this to your partner uh, because you're, you know, this could be something that's troubling for you and you want to see how they react or respond. You need what you need when you need it. You're not using this as ammunition against them, but this is a time where uh, you could be struggling and you need additional support and you should get it. Here's the last piece of this. And this was, this was what I said to our PBT member as well. When you are uh, constantly, constantly being bombarded with these types of conversations, when this is the conversation all the time, 
It also may bring up who am I spending my time with? Because think about it, and I say this a lot, as you change, your circle very often changes too. Your relationships very often change too. Because what used to be acceptable no longer is. What used to uh, be okay to talk about no longer is. You know, I remember, I think it was Neil Donald Walsh who said, the, uh, how do you know someone's level of consciousness? And, you know, I always botch up quotes, but it's something like, how do you know someone's level of consciousness? It's, it's around, see what they find entertain, entertaining. Isn't that so interesting? What's entertaining, if you're at one level of consciousness, may be very, very different than when you're at a different level. And you always hear me talking about the, the five stages from betrayal to breakthrough. And I always talk about one of the most significant things I see when people leave stage three into stage four is they see relationships very clearly and very differently. I mean, of course you have these friends who are near and dear and they're, you know, they're, they're ride or die. You know, they are with you and, and you accept the good, the bad, the ugly, the, all of it, because these are just people that you are super close with for life. I'm not talking about them, but there are other people in your life who they are at a certain level, uh, you know, of awareness of consciousness. And as you're doing this deep transformative work, you're ready for something different. You're ready for something, uh, you're ready for a different level of conversation. And it's just, you find that the conversations change when you're you're surrounded by people who are like-minded, where they're more about growth and maybe personal development, or uh, they have just something exciting going on in their lives, or spirituality, or whatever it is, right? Whatever it is, but you find the conversation is very different. So the last piece of this is, if that's constantly the conversation, have you, uh, and it's more obvious than ever, is it, is it um, a call to take a look and say, you know, I still love these friends for, for who and where they, you know, they are you know, in my life, but I'm ready for something more. I'm ready for a different level of conversation. I'm ready for growth. You know, I have so many different types of friends for so many different reasons. And, you know, some of my, the, the best, the best, best, best conversations I have with friends. I mean, they are so excited about what they're doing to change the world, you know, in their way. Now, before I, my experience, like I never, I never probably really could relate to anybody like that. And it was just so different to me, but somebody, and I remember thinking to myself, wow, you know what? I like people who are very anything, be very anything, very enthusiastic about whatever your thing is, you know, changing the world, uh, growing a garden, whatever, right? Whatever your thing is. But when someone is uh, excited about life, they're lit up about something in their lives. But when they're not, that may be because the, you know they haven't discovered, haven't found interest in, haven't changed. So these, you know, so the, so maybe the most interesting conversation is who's doing what to who, right? So maybe it's time to take a look and say, who am I spending my time with? And I, I, I these are my dear friends. I, I don't want to do anything to let, you know, minimize the, those relationships, but I want to make room and make time for growth friends, for people who help me grow, for people who help me think differently, think bigger, because you may find that as you grow, it's, you're ready for a different conversation. And that's exactly what you have. So the conversations you're having, uh, like stage three conversations don't interest you in stage four. Stage four conversations may not interest you, interest you when you're in stage five. So what I, I love, I love that quote where people are, uh, you know, you can, you can tell someone's level of consciousness by what they find entertaining. So if that's not entertaining for you, it's because you're growing and because you have uh, other things you'd rather be talking about. And, um, and, and talk, you know, working on and whatever. So we, we covered a lot of things. There was a, uh, it was a, there was a Wayne Dyer, another Wayne Dyer quote that, that I love. And I just, I meant to bring it up earlier, but I want to make sure I bring it up too. And it's, um, 
what you think of me is none of my, none of my business, right? We're so concerned about what other people think. And this is a hard thing, right? Where we're betrayed and we're like, uh Oh, am I, I'm branded with this on my, on my forehead. I'm betrayed. And then, and so then we go into do, they, do those people think I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy enough to, I think I'm not good enough, not worthy enough. And we go into this whole tailspin of, of what, what will they think? What do they think? And the truth is who cares? Who cares? You know how you think. You know your motivation behind what you do. You know you're doing the work to heal. You know uh, what your intention is. You can't be responsible for what other people think. And I know this is a really hard one. And I'll tell you, this has been such uh, such work personally for me because when I became, I'm a very private person, believe it or not. And you all know my story. Um, and this was a really hard one, but when the message became so much more important than what people would say, it, it, it just became a no brainer. And I remember the first time this, I, I came across this was when the discoveries were made, when the five stages showed up and I'll never forget my, um, my study chair who said, Debbie, I believe you've discovered a process here. And it was the five stages. And I was like, well, how in the world do I keep this to myself? But I was filled with so much shame. I was filled with so much embarrassment and judgment. I'm like, how do I, how do I talk about this? I could talk about it from a research standpoint, but when people think and people know I've experienced this, oh my gosh, do I have to talk about this? It's so embarrassing. It's so, I mean, I went through all of it, all of it, which I know you're going through too, or you've been through. And then when I wrote trust again, and it was all in there. And then when I did, I'll never forget to even doing the first podcast, not on this podcast, I was on someone else's podcast. And it was the first time I was ready to talk about it. And it was audio, thank goodness. And she said, Debbie, are you ready? And I was like, I don't know if I could do this. I mean, I was nauseous. I was sweating. And I remember closing my eyes and, and clasping my hands. And I was like, let's go. And I just did it. And, and I survived. And then I remember doing the, the Ted, uh, both Ted talks. Well, the first one was six weeks after my betrayal. Um, stop sabotaging, are you stop sabotaging yourself? And I couldn't speak about it then. You could hear me hinting about it, but I wasn't ready to fully talk about it. And then the second one, when I did that one, do you have post betrayal syndrome? I mean, that was hard. That was hard. And then, uh, just all of the interviews and all the podcasts and writing the books and everything else. And I realized what people think of me is none of my business. It's all about how I think about myself. How am I moving through this? Am I moving through this in a way that makes me proud? Am I moving through this in a way that as I look back, I'll be proud of how I handled things, what I did, the choices I made, uh, what I taught my kids, what I, what I taught people within the PBT Institute, what, what I'm sharing with our, uh, cer you know, our PBT certified coaches and support group hosts. Will I be proud? And you know what? Here to say, yes, I am. Yes, I am. So it's really all about hard now, easy later, easy now, hard later. Take your pick. It's going to be one of those two. But that's not to say you don't need tools and resources and all kinds of things as you're going through it. So if you're going to these parties, these events with people who are saying hurtful things, meaningly, you know, meaningly, is that a word? Uh, knowingly, unknowingly have your toolkit available to best manage these experiences, uh, have your own set of ideas about what you're doing, why you're doing it, what feels right for you. If you are rebuilding, great opportunity for your partner to show up powerfully and fully and check your friendships. Because if, if these are the dominant conversations, if these are pretty much you know, the majority of conversations you have, are you ready for an upgrade? Are you ready to up-level your relationships where that's not the only conversation there is? And conversations are much more fulfilling, rewarding, and uh, satisfying to you. So lots to take a look at uh, and so much more, of course, within the PBT Institute. This is all we do all day long. If we can help you there, that's what we're here to do. But 
uh, this is the work of warriors. It is, as I say, on our open Q&A to the community with me, we call them coffee chats, and I pretty much say it all the time. Uh, this is probably the hardest and the most transformative work you'll ever do. Moving through the stages is not for the meek, but the version you become as you enter into stages four and five is so worth it. And if you even had a taste of what stages four and five felt like, you wouldn't waste a minute in stage three, the most common place we get stuck. So of course, if we can help you with that, just reach out. Uh, but something to think about as you likely encounter these conversations um, and just some tips and tools to handle them a little bit easier. I hope that helps. I'll see you next time. You need the right tools, support, and the right community to move through the five stages from betrayal to breakthrough. And we have all that within the PBT Institute. So join us at the PBT, as in post-betrayal transformation, thepbtinstitute.com. There's a version of you who's so confident, healthy, peaceful, and happy on the other end of your healing. And we can't wait to help you get there. We got you. Thanks for listening. And here's to your breakthrough.